Thank you. So I think that was the signal to say we are good to go. So welcome everyone to the session on open source in Irish government. Uh, welcome to everyone in the room and welcome to everyone online who may be viewing us. My name is Claire Dillon. Uh, I'm the executive director of Inner Source Commons, which is a community for folks who want to do open source practices inside uh, organizations behind a firewall. Um, but I am also the co-founder of Open Ireland Network, which is a community uh, for individuals and organizations in Ireland who want to come together around the principles of open source and understanding how we can uh, support open source community and ecosystem in Ireland. And I'm delighted to be joined here today by uh, three esteemed panelists with apologies from our fourth who couldn't make it at short notice. So we'll, we'll send Tim our regrets and I hope wherever you are, Tim, everything is going well. Um, but uh, we, we are here today to talk about uh, open source in the Irish government, um, a little bit about what's happening today, a little bit about what the opportunities may be, um, and a little bit about what we heard this morning perhaps, because we had some exciting announcements this morning as well, so we might get into that as well, if we have time. So we will start by uh, getting our panellists to introduce themselves and maybe give a very brief overview of your own experiences with open source in the context of Irish government. John, would you like to kick start, please? Sure. Good morning, everybody. Um, John Concannon is my name. I'm the Director General of the Global Ireland Programme for the Irish government, based in the Department of Foreign Affairs. And the Global Ireland Programme was uh, launched in 2018, and the objective to double Ireland's impact and influence in the world by 2025. And there's a range of uh, endeavours that we have undertaken to do that. Uh, for example, the opening of um, a whole series of new embassies and consulates. We had 80 at the start of our programme. We've, we've planned to open 26. Uh, we've now 23. The announced are open. The most recent three last week, Munich, uh, Milan and Islamabad. Um, so big, big programme. And in, in addition to that, I suppose the reason why I'm here on the panel is in addition to these, these, these missions, these physical buildings, uh, we, which we call Ireland Houses, where the full collective of Irish government is present overseas. We have a major program called Digital Ireland House, which is to bring it all together into the cloud and have a, have a much more robust, enhanced, dynamic digital presence internationally. And in doing that, we're working through with Tony and the team in OGCIO uh, with an open source platform, Wagtail. Um, so that's my, uh, but, but my experience in the technical open source world is almost zero. Um, but I've, I, I, I'm a big believer in conceptually, and, and uh, we can maybe talk more about that. That's brilliant, John. Thank Gar you. Thanks, Next, John. Gar McCreesta, please. Thanks, John. That's Tony. I'm Gar. <laughs> so I'm Gar McCreesta. I work as a digital advisor in eHealth in the HSE. So HSE is the health service executive, so it's responsible for delivering healthcare services to the population of Ireland. Um, I guess, uh, so my role is kind of varied, so I cut across lots of different things, lots of different programs, but the, I guess, where, from an open source perspective and from a HSE perspective, it really started with COVID trackers. So at the start of COVID-19, it was trying to solve a problem of, of finding two people who were too close together for too long, where one of them had COVID. And hence, so COVID tracker is the, is the Irish implementation of it, and COVID Green is the Linux Foundation Public Health Project that stemmed from that, that's in five states in the US, a number of other jurisdictions in Europe, and bits of it are in the New Zealand app. So it's kind of, it kind of stemmed from that. And I guess the, I think we'll, we'll dive a bit deeper kind of in, in subsequent pieces in terms of uh, the why and the what and what we did with that. But that has led to kind of a, an exploration in terms of where we can collaborate and how, I guess that, and you touched on the philosophy of open source. So how the philosophy of open source changed the way we thought about solving bigger problems and how do we work together. And that's turned into both locally in Ireland, but also internationally within the EU and then internationally more broadly, globally with other governments and how, how that has kind of worked and how that's kind of, it's helped us, but it's fundamentally changed the way people think about it. And I think that's probably more so than the software, it's more just the philosophy and the community around it is kind of where, where I see the biggest impact from some of this. So that's Thanks, me. Gar. Tony. Thank you. Hi there, uh, Tony Shannon. I'm Head of Digital Services here in the Office of the Government CO in the Government of Ireland. Um, I guess I could say I, I'm an advocate for open source in government. I got that from my background as a medical doctor. Um, I ended up uh, in the National Programme for IT in the NHS pushing open source about 15 years ago. There wasn't much appetite for that then, but over time we've seen open source taking over the software industry. Um, it is slowly coming to places like healthcare, Linux Foundation, Public Health, etc., doing some great leadership work. Uh, I was involved in a, a non-profit open source foundation before I came into this role. 
Um, I do think that the challenges we face in government, be that at a local level, a regional level, a national level, or an international level, are, are kind of a fractal. There's a there's a pattern, a set of patterns there. Um, they're the same all over the world. Um, there's a big challenge we have, be it you know, people improving the lives of the people or saving the planet to cooperate and collaborate around some of these wicked challenges. And I think open source is, is the ideal medium to do that. Um, so, you know, that's why we're here today to kind of talk about some of the stuff we're doing locally in Ireland, but also, you know, we're, I'm very pleased to hear the news today about the European launch of Linux Foundation. I think that's a, that's a good move for, from a European point of view. Great. Thank you, Tony. And I'll come back to you, John. I think what we'll start with with this discussion is a little bit about the why you would go with open source. So just to put some context on this particular discussion, um, there have sometimes been various different debates about, uh, about you know, open source, why you should always use open source or no, let's not always use open source. Let's always use proprietary code. Um, and I think that one of the things that has been most interesting about recent discussions is that this is a continuum, right? There are certain scenarios where open source obviously makes more sense. So I'm really interested to hear from the panel today about why, where you've used open source, what were the reasonings behind that, and what was the impact and outcome you were trying to achieve? Thanks. I, my experience of, of the, I suppose, the principles of open source are um, much in the wider, big, big, some of the projects I've been involved in, not so much in the technology. Um, and I'll give you one, one of them, um, which, which I'll, and I've really seen the huge benefit of an open source approach to things. Um, I'll give you one example. In um, 2016 here in Ireland, it was our centenary of, as uh, in 1916, we had, a, we had a rebellion. We were up, up to that point for part of the British Empire. We subsequently became an independent state. So in, 19, in 2016, it was a very big, important moment for the country and the government decided to uh, have a, a, a program, a centenary program. Uh, to do it. And it, it was tricky because um, it was very political, very different views, there's multiple narratives of different interpretations. Um, and I was uh, asked to be the project director for it, um, and working on that project. And the principle we took was a very much an open source idea. So in, in so far as the government, we set a framework um, for, the, for the strands of programming we're going to do. And altogether, I think we created maybe, you know, maybe about two or 300 events here and around the world. Um, but what we did was go out to the community around Ireland. There's 26 counties in Ireland. We had meetings with people. We asked people ideas. We, we encouraged, said, look, these are the principles we're trying to do. These are our values about our identity, about what democracy is, what does citizenship mean, how do we get people engaged? And um, we were absolutely blown away with the response. In it, like so many ideas came to us, but actually that executed things that happened. Um, well, we had about 200, we'll say 250 events. There was over three and a half thousand events designed and curated by the public, and and other and lots of stuff. Um, so just that context of you know people really igniting innovation. In fact, coincidentally, Gar here was one of the ideas because. Uh, they came up with an idea which was to, to use a Minecraft concept called uh, rising, mind, mind Rising, which was engaging young people who were interested in Minecraft to build the 1916 buildings, which was fabulous. But the government, we would never have thought of that in a million years. Uh, so that context of open source innovation is something that I, I, throughout my time and my career has really, and, and there's lots of other examples I, I could draw on, but that's one. So coming to this project of the Digital Ireland House, um, I was involved in, 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 in 2017 with the, uh, with the Prime Minister's Office here at the Department of Taoiseach about the move to gov.ie with OGCIO in the government's Chief Information Office. And we worked a lot with the uh, British government at the time and their project was gov.co.uk which was open source and it was very clear to me the speed of, speed of innovation was very, very fast and the, the, the mindset of sharing, building collaborative uh, teams was really, really impressive for lots of different reasons that didn't, wasn't how we progressed with gov.ie, um, but when the opportunity came to, for us to build Ireland.ie, so the gov.ie platform is a very big platform now in Ireland, it's the most traffic site in the country, it's really about services to the citizens, but when we were developing that we thought okay we have another platform, it, w it won't be as relevant for people overseas because Ireland, you know, it's, we're, very, we're, we're, we're very active internationally but we're small, so we have to be much more publishing, pushing our content out, so we needed a more of a publishing platform, so hence Ireland.ie is about bringing together a sense of Ireland as a place to live, visit, work, study, invest, and very importantly it's 
that's the platform for 94 or 94 open missions that are open, but in, in total it will be for the 106 when they're all open. So there are missions, embassies, consulates, the publishing platforms for those, which essentially would be microsites, as well as a platform for our consular and travel information, passports and so on. So it's a really important window to the world. And in conversations with Tony, uh, who's, who, who uh, I wasn't expecting it at all, when we started talking about how will we develop this, we want to partner with OGCO, that principle of collaboration was of course at the core of it. Up until that point, the Department of Foreign Affairs had done all this development itself. But partnering with OGCO made a lot of sense. And immediately Tony was talking about open source. So that was just a fantastic opportunity. And we just, the, the, you know, as Tom Peter says, when the window of opportunity opens, don't close the curtains. So we really went for it and um, subsequently took a lot of the leadership from Tony's team. And now we're, we're full steam ahead on, a, I think, a really interesting and exciting open source project uh, using um, Wagtail is the software we're using um, to develop um, this site. We're going to be fully operational. We're in beta format at the moment, but we're fully operational for Patrick's Day 2023, which should be this you know, very strong, strong presence of Ireland around the world. Very, very exciting. That's brilliant, John. And I just want to kind of, you know, click down on some of the themes you were talking about there because I think what's been really interesting from talking to representatives in Irish government is that there's a cultural shift happening within government organisations at the moment. This idea of collaborating across departmental boundaries is something that's happening anyway. It sounds like open source can be one of the things that can help that happen. And then, of course, the idea of collaborating across national boundaries is something that we have learned a lot about in the last uh, number of uh, months and years in terms of the need for that, sometimes at a very quick pace when something urgent happens happens or sometimes when you're strategically looking at something that will evolve brilliantly over the over the coming years when you want to bring innovation coming from many different countries so we may be a small country but the Irish are everywhere so we want to be able to enable them everywhere and um, so thanks a million for John and good luck with that initiative. Uh, Gar can I ask you to maybe elaborate then on your reasoning behind an open source journey? Uh, I guess this started for me a long, long time ago, started 25 years, and it was more trying to solve problems across in many different organisations and many different domains, and I've worked an awful lot in the public service, and it's, uh, it's trying to, like, one of the challenges we face is there is a tendency to think we know everything and not, and analyse things. So we spend an awful lot of time analysing and documenting things and figuring it out, but actually building to learn is a much better, much more effective way of doing it. And actually you brought me all the way back with Mind Rising, which was the past, present and future of Ireland, but it was a building activity. It was like a creational act. And I think having these building blocks and having the, the ability to pick something up and quickly turn uh, an idea into something that people can see, touch, feel, understand, interact with, it's a very powerful concept and it's a very powerful way of doing it. So roll forward to what we were doing from a, a COVID perspective. So COVID Tracker started with trying to solve a problem, finding two people who were too close for too long where one of them had COVID. That was an exploration into how could technology help with that. It wasn't an app. It didn't start there. Uh, but I think given the privacy considerations that came out of this, the primary driver originally was around transparency. So people wanted to know, right? And I, I'm, I'm looking back in the back left-hand corner of this. We have many conversations. But uh, so th there were an awful lot of people who were very interested in because, I mean, the opportunity to engage with and interact with a large population of citizens and the implications of that from a privacy perspective are huge. And so actually understanding what that means and opening it up. So the trans so the first bit was open sourcing the, the code to, so people could see it and then publishing things so people could interact with it and then being available to interact and having those conversations and being open to it. That was the first bit. The secondary effect was that, and we've had a constant uh, collaboration with Northern Ireland. We've had a very consistent collaboration really across the Celtic fringe, as uh, as one of our Scottish colleagues calls it. So it's, yeah, so Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. So we, we've been having this ongoing piece. So there was an immediate sharing of that and it was sharing and we had open sourced it and all of a sudden it was much easier for them to pick it up as opposed to us trying to give them it in a different way. So then you roll forward from that and then other people became interested in this. So New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, they wanted to pick it up and then so moving it in. So you need a vehicle because the HSE has no experience in open sourcing things. So I set up the, the GitHub repo, right? So I set up the organization, set it up. It was the first one there. We published the code and it was like, okay, that's great. But in terms of actually building a community around it or supporting it in any meaningful way, that was the hard bit. Mm. So enter LFPH. So the conversation started with the Linux Foundation Public Health Project. How do we get this into something, into a vehicle that other people can pick up consume, use, how do we support and how do we grow? And that's been an ongoing pursuit. And it's kind of followed through with some of the other COVID stuff that we've done. Like nearly everything that we've built on top of COVID, all of it's been open source, some of it's been reused, some of it hasn't. 
right? And I think that's one of the challenges with this is it's finding things where it works or where it doesn't work. And I've always considered myself to be both digitally promiscuous and digitally pra pragmatic, <laughs> right? So I, I, I don't care if we're trying to solve a problem that's focused on the problem we're trying to solve. If it fits, it fits. For me, I think where open source fits perfectly well is if this fits into UN sustainable development goals. So it's a big problem that we're all fighting and it's a big problem that we can all get in behind then th this totally makes sense as a way of looking at solving those kind of problems, both from a problem solving perspective and from a software and distribution perspective. So it's across the board with that. So that's kind of where I'm coming from on it, Claire. Yeah, thanks, Gar. I'm just going to add into that because the whole idea of the transparency thing, I think one of the uh, maybe, I don't know, unintended consequences mm. was also the opening it up to citizens, right? So not just from a privacy concern perspective, but making them feel like they had agency around what the technology that was coming out to address these kind of big global problems. Um, and I, I just remember the uh, I was looking at the repo when it was put up and I had started and I was saying, now, it's open. What amazing innovation is going to happen on top of the you know COVID tracker app? And I remember one of the first uh, pull requests that went in was like you're spelling Cahir Sivine wrong which is like this tiny town in like the, the corner of Ireland and I was thinking okay I wasn't expecting that as an innovation point but you know what it really gives agency to people in Cahir Sivine to make this the right thing for them um, and for me that was a huge part of um, it that people felt like they had an ability to impact the technology that was impacting them and I think that was one of the reasons why it was so popular in terms of people then downloading it as well as the Mark of uh, mark of okay from the trust folks in Ireland. So thank you for that, Carl. Tony. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So I mean, to me, open source just makes sense on so many levels that you know, I could be talking here for quite a while. I mean, I think in terms of people, process, tech. I mean, John's made a very good case from a people point of view, why the open governance around working in an open way and governing a project in an open way is the right thing to do. I mean, particularly in the public sector, it shouldn't be done much in any other way. And Gar's made the point about the kind of the co-creation that that enables, that again, you know, wouldn't be, it isn't possible without the open source dimension, or at least that's been a barrier to it. Um, from a tech point of view, I would say that um, a couple of things there, there's a, there's a lot of money I think that in, in this part of the world, uh, I would say the richer part of the world that we're lucky to live in that has been wasted on poor tech. Um, I think, you know, we're now coming to a crunch or we've been talking about a crunch uh, for a while and how we can spend our money more smartly. I think if you look at the leaders in open source in the government sector, they are from the low and middle income countries. And we have a lot to learn from, from them actually and how they spend their money. I think part of that is that, um, again, coming back to how you, the tech is built. You know, my my early years were in medicine and, you know, to, to look at that field, you know, medicine is a science where you have to publish your findings or you go, you don't get to, taken seriously. And again, software, I would, would argue with, with, with folk here, is a relatively immature discipline in terms of the first master's degree in software engineering was in the 1980s or something like that. So software is kind of exploding and growing but it isn't mature yet in many ways, in, 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 in if you take the long long view. And so how do you, can you ju judge what's good software? The only way you can do that is, is to see the source code. So, you know, if you look at o an open approach to the source code and you then realize that actually an open source way of getting your source code published and then cooperating with others means you can actually save money and reuse things. Um, it's the only sensible way, really, in my mind, to make uh, software now. And I think the, 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 the explosion we've seen in the software industry in the last 10 years has shown it makes sense from a commercial point of view just as much. And so that's why if you look at the, the, the vast challenges that any government has, and if you look at the leaders um, internationally, there's probably bring your attention to GovStack which is this idea of identify 25 building blocks that are common generic building blocks and, and try to collaborate on those. And one of them is the CMS, and we'll talk to John about the, the CMS that we're using, Whitetail, that's actually been used in our set here, with our department, got John's and the HSE. They're using that open source building block. We're also talking to Gar and the HSE and Tim, who isn't here today, um, from the Gar D, the police force, about one other building block around data collection forms. So we're looking at, 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 at how we could do that better. And guess what? The Singaporean government, who are leaders in digital government, have actually released an open source engine called Forms SG. We're looking to learn from that. So on so many levels, 
from a people point of view around the governance, from a process point of view on the co-creation, and from a tech point of view in terms of quality and value for money of code, um, there's just only one way to, to sensibly do it, I would argue. Thanks, Tony, and, and, and thanks for all that, the, the exploration about the why. So I'm hearing themes of innovation, collaboration across borders and, and in organizational and national borders, um, speed, uh, cost savings, governance, a maturing of how we build software all together and an, an ability to address the big world problems. So then if we, if we think about that as a set of opportunities and then look to see how we might be able to, I suppose, accelerate those opportunities in Ireland. Um, can you maybe have a comment about what you think might help us in this journey and help all governments in this journey to be able to achieve those outcomes? Do you want, will we start again with, with John? Just for. Um, that's, a, that's a really good question. It's a ah. hard one. Um, <laughs> but uh, I think, you know, innovation is very hard in yes. any organization. And, um, but innovation in government is very, very hard mm. because the appetite for risk is, is very different than, than in, a, in a commercial entity. Um, so I think you do need, uh, you need leadership, which we have clearly got very great leadership with Tony now coming through and that thought leadership. But, you know, validation of the ideas, continuous case studies uh, to talk to people about it. But innovation is hard. The tried and tested is much easier to as, as um, uh, you know, but but uh, I think the idea of uh, how do we do it, it's really welcome, by the way, that uh, there's a European um, chapter of the Linux Foundation that really validates the whole organization. Ireland, by the way, is celebrating this year our 50th anniversary of the European Union, which in, in the context of collaboration is a huge collaborative endeavor yeah. that has transformed our society. So that's an organization we'd like to play a big a part of and, and, and be very much involved in. So that's, that's very good news. And, um, you know, linking things into big, big ideas like uh, Gar talked about sustainable development goals, of course, mm -hmm. just again, another fun fact, Ireland in 2015 co-chaired the negotiation that led to that at the UN in, in 2015. But one of the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the General Assembly, which is on next week, by the way, in New York, it's like the Ploughing Championships for International <laughs> Diplomacy. <laughs> That's and, an Irish uh, thing. Uh, Look it up. Also. Which is also on next week. <laughs> but but uh, Antonio Guterres two years ago said, you know, we have 17 SDGs and they're all very important, but without the final one, number 17, it just won't work. And number 17 is really about what we're talking about today, which is number seven, partnership for the goals. How can we collaborate? How can we bring things together? So I think the, the context is, fits really well into that macro policy, but uh, validating it and, um, and, and um, that idea that Gar said there, you know, just uh, innovate as we go, keep, keep little iterations, keep um, as against just building these massive systems that may or may not work at the end. But, um, uh, uh, you know, it's, but it's, it's uh, um, I suppose it's, it's a continual journey of, of both developing great st software and, and apps and, and technology, but also the, the education of it. We find that's a big role in, yeah. in, in our world and in the foreign service because almost all of our teams are diplomats, aren't technology people. So yeah. how do we get them to engage and get them communicated with and trained? But that's that part of it. And, and I'll add into that. I'm glad you brought up the, the, the topic of education because, I mean, you learn so much at conferences like this, but they're for the open source community. And, and I personally think, like I've, I've only came into the open source community in the last few years, and there's a huge opportunity to bring the messages and techniques and methods that we learn here to a much wider audience who are open to looking for ways to collaborate better um, and uh, we recently just did a research report with ICT technology uh, sorry technology Ireland ICT skillnet around the open source skills gap in Ireland and it was noted what surprised me was that it wasn't just technical skills there was a huge call out and a need for a bigger understanding in business leaders in sales and marketing uh, talent in legal talent in uh, in so many different areas that you wouldn't automatically think of and what are we doing to educate everyone around these principles principles around how to do it, around why to do it, around when to do it, um, and indeed the pathway to doing it successfully. So thanks for bringing that up, um, John. It's a, it's a great one. Uh, Gar, ways in which we can support the journey? I couldn't remember what the question was. Yeah, that's why I, I, really I prompted couldn't. you there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so uh, I guess there's, it's nearly a perfect storm. So, uh, so some of the stuff that's happening at a European level. So that report, uh, Open Forum Europe, some of the other work that's going on there, like invariably all of the EU projects that are kicking off at the moment, they are all embracing that. They're all going down that particular route, regardless of who they're affiliated with or how it's working. Everybody's kind of beginning to work in that way. And I think, so forget the software for a second. I think the community piece is really interesting because, yeah. so if you take when the COVID certs were first proposed, 
and so it came out and it was the e-health directors across Europe and everybody got together and they agreed the format and the standards and everything else but it quickly migrated from a from actually a knowledge sharing and collaboration perspective it moved over to slack channels that were on the fly set up in the Linux Foundation public health project and that's because that was the easiest place for people to actually get together and it was epidemiologists from around the world there was technologists there was data scientists there was you name it anybody you needed an answer from they were there and they were there and they were helpful because the community ethos is there and i think typically what happens in like in a lot of organizations so i, I think like so some of the collaborations we've had over the past couple of years tony as well are illustrative of this is that there is a tendency for organizations to optimize locally and to try and solve problems on their own and i think that the shift is to begin to look at cross boundaries and so how do we collaborate with each other in a more effective way and this helps so and again it's a it's more a philosophical shift than it is a software shift the software gets dragged behind it and it's a useful way of uh, of manifesting some of these changes but it doesn't necessarily start with that sometimes it can but it doesn't always have to so i, I think that's kind of one of the biggest things here i think at a like at a national level it's like some of the approaches that have been taken to kind of drive open source it's in some in some cases it, it could be problematic because like you're pushing water uphill like it, it's it's really hard to kind of push it in and say you must do this because in some cases look I, i'm an architect that's what i've spent my entire career being and architects are about trade-offs so in all cases there's a trade-off so it's like i can have this or this I, I can't have both so when i look at that then i'm making choices all the time and these are choices that we make so frameworks around how we make choices and thinking through that rather than mandating kind of blindly saying you must or you mustn't those kind of things are that that kind of external constraint can be problematic because it kind of drives a different set of behaviors and actually you can you could subvert the entire process and we find interesting and new ways to get around all of these things or get around all of these regulations which happens in nearly every other or like entity or domain or a, any other problem space once you put that in and put that hard constraint in it has potentially unexpected effects so I, I think the problem will be it's like how do we do this in a way and I think the education piece is the way to go because it, it's showing why it's useful and demonstrating the value of it that's where to start with this stuff yeah. it's not at the other end of it in my it's mind I, I'll just uh, comment as well because that that idea of bureaucracy busting like that open source gives you a pathway to to kind of collaborate before you get like all the formal like the government has a lot of formal structures about how to do things and um, open source if you're into it almost gives you that permission to collaborate before how you have to actually you know tackle the, the bureaucracy around these collaborations and we've heard certainly from some of the examples we've seen in the Ospo++ network which is for uh, open source program offices and public sector they, they've they've commented about how these cross-border um, uh, collaborations can happen because you've got individuals in different countries all able to collaborate on open source platforms without necessarily having to go through NDAs and IP transfer agreements and all this sort of thing so they can do that much more easily so uh, you actually brought me back to something I forgot about. So at the start of the whole process with COVID Tracker, Singapore had released uh, a contact tracing app at the very beginning. And they said they were going to open source it. And actually, this is where uh, so the Foreign Service came in, because the immediate thing was, now this poor guy over in Singapore, poor Stephen, <laughs> he got landed on by, uh, I'd say, 40 or 50 different countries coming through various different channels, everything from Interpol to like the local ambassadors in different countries who were knocking on different doors saying, can we get it? Can we get it? Can we get it? And it, it's, it does become, it was a really interesting place where we all kind of met together in the middle. Now, the guys in the foreign service, so the, the embassy in Singapore were, they didn't know what they were asking for. They just knew they had a question to ask for. And this, but again, it kicked off a collaboration that we worked with those guys probably for the next six or seven months. And they were incredibly helpful because that's where they were coming from as well. Now, the problem they had was they were trying to deploy an app at the same time as satisfy the needs of 40 other countries who were all knocking on the door going this is great can we have it right we didn't end up going that particular direction but it, it is kind of one of those interesting side effects from it it, it, it's, a, it's a great one. I, I hadn't thought that we'd come up with using the Irish Diplomatic Service as, a, as an actual <laughs> avenue for exploring uh, evangelism around open source, but perhaps we'll have a chat about that later, John. <laughs> that might be a, a good one. Tony. Okay, so the question being, again, how we can promote uh, and get... How, uh, yeah. what, what, what sort of things can help us on the journey yeah. to being able to uh, accelerate these outcomes? Sure, I think... Um, you know, we have to be conscious that we're talking about what technically would be called a complex adaptive system at play. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of 
elements going on here. A lot of people, a lot of different projects, a lot of tech all in the mix. And you can't, you can't control all of that from the top down. You, you just have to, um, you know, understand that there's going to be patterns that are at play. And, and, and you're also going to see you know, stuff emerge from the bottom up. But I think, um, you know, carrots and sticks can help with that complexity and kind of can encourage good behavior and, and the right outcomes. And I think, you know, the good news is that, you know, you're all here. This is a bigger crowd, you know, that we've seen before in, in Ireland and Dublin around open sources conference is a, is a bit of a landmark event in that extent. And you can tell there's momentum behind us now uh, on this move. So, you know, what, what kind of carrots and sticks do we need? Um, you know, uh, we obviously, and I'm making the case, you know, internally that we need to um, invest in this area and, you know, uh, you all can take that message back that, you know, that, that wherever you're working, that investment in open source is a good thing. And that's something that we need to be encouraging at, at, at a governmental level. Um, and, and we don't need a lot of investment to kind of try to, to move the dial forward, but just a little bit will, will help. Uh, sticks, if I mention sticks, now the European Union has a tendency to bring in regulations. Um, to kind of encourage us to do the right thing, if you like. And I'm not always convinced that that's the right thing to do, but it does have a serious effect if you look at GDPR. And if you look at what's coming now around, let's say there's going to be European legislation around a, a digital wallet that's coming. So if you put the, the carrot of investment with the news that came out today around the Open Wallet Foundation, with the, with the stick at a European level around, you know, the need for a digital wallet that should be open standards based, then you've got the mix there to actually really make major change in people's lives within this decade on an open source based digital wallet infrastructure that will probably change the game, really. Um, and I think that's that was my immediate impression when I heard that news today. Yeah. Uh, that's going to definitely change the dynamic and, and it's a good a force for the good. Um, we just need to be spreading that word and trying to work out how we can make that a win-win for all concerned, I think. So I, I wouldn't be talking too much about trying to control this from the top too much. We can, we can set, you know, the right kind of environment to encourage this, but then we have to let, you know, the state and the market collaborate together to make this work, you know. And I, I'm going to explicitly now, I mentioned earlier things like um, OSPO's open source program right. offices. And, yeah. and obviously there is a, there's been, you know, OSPO Con is here today or, and yeah. at, at the event. Um, and we know that there's a big trend in Europe in terms of actually an explosion of, of folks actually looking at this as a construct that can perhaps help the journey. Mm -hmm. um, do you maybe want to comment about how you see that fitting in from an Ireland perspective? If there's, a, you know, sure. would it help yeah. that kind of thing? And, and we've talked about an OSPO in Ireland before and, and we've been kind of hesitant as to when to do that because we didn't want to, we don't want to make an announcement just for the sake of yep. it as i think the keynote speaker said this morning the whole point of all of this here isn't about you know numbers or, or dollars or euros it's about impacts on people's lives and and that's really the driver if we're going to do that set that up we want to see an impact out of it i think um you know it may be that we're coming towards the time is right on that that it does help perhaps set the foundation you know set the seeds of the of the of that ecosystem environment that I said would make for fertile ground here. You know, I think it wouldn't be too much of a stretch to talk about if you were to put an OSPO together in Ireland that was to bring the main tech players that are just down the road here together with government players and other SME players together. Then, you, and you were to look at we had content management stuff that we have to do or digital credential, digital wallet stuff we have to do um, with one impact in mind, which is to, to have an impact on, on the citizens' lives. And even if, I'll just go back to one story that, that shows how easily we can do that, which is what happened with the digital code, code certificate and the European Union released some open source code. And last year we were involved in releasing that. And over about a month's period, not only did we release uh, the, the digital credential certificate that allowed people to travel across Europe, but we also released a validator app that allowed people to get into the restaurants and the, and the hotels. We released that over a weekend, weekend. and again, it, it just made a major impact on people's lives. So I think, you know, it won't take too much to have an impact. We need it to be focused and, and goal oriented. But I think the conditions are coming right for that pretty soon now. Thanks a million, Tony. So we have about five minutes left. So I just want to open it up to see if anyone has any questions. Would you like to share your question? Uh, hey, Brian. Sure. Uh, so I'm Brian Milder. I lead the Open Source Security Foundation. Um, uh, John, I imagine your holidays were fine, but Gar and, and uh, Tony, I imagine your holidays might have been disrupted by the log for j vulnerability <laughs> uh, uh, had broached in December and then uh, caused a lot of constant uh, uh, hubbub, uh, let's just say. Um, 
how did that affect uh, the government, the Irish government's perception of open source software uh, uh, as either a security risk or, or, or on the other side, you know, watching the community respond to it as an advantage? And then what, where do you see kind of the Irish government making investments in, uh, in security and open source software going forward? And might I ask you to just briefly repeat the question just for the recording, because they may not have heard Brian there on the, on the camera. It's about... Log4j. <laughs> yeah, so, so in general, the question was around uh, Log4j as a disruptive force. Uh, what was the uh, feelings about that in the Irish government? What responses uh, or changes may they be making on the back of that particular event? Gar. Thanks, Brian. <laughs> a bomb with that one. Um, I guess, I mean, the immediate thing is it's around visibility. So do we know, do we know who's using it? Do we know where it is? And I think that's software supply chain. Do we understand the, our vulnerability and the exposure to it? Uh, I think that's one major thing. So it did highlight that. And I think that's kind of the key bit. So like from a HSE perspective, it's where it's being used and who's using it, how, what version, where are we at? What's the exposure to it? Has anything happened? So they were, they were the kind of things that kind of came from that. I guess we had a bigger issue. So the Log4j was kind of minor in comparison to the middle of well, May last year when we got hit by a cyber attack that collapsed the health system in Ireland. So it was the Log4j piece was kind of, it, it's on the back of that. So it's not that it wasn't important, but it paled in comparison to what we had to deal with in the middle of last year, which is turn everything off, turn it all back on again. It's like, okay, <laughs> right? And anybody who is like anywhere near this and every citizen of Ireland, this touched you somehow, yeah. right? And so I, I think it has highlighted that fact of understanding software supply chains, understanding the assets that we've got, understanding where things are. are. And it's not necessarily a technology piece. This is a knowledge management problem more so than that, all right? So I, I think it's changed the way people think about what we need to know and how we need to know it and when we need to know it. So I think that's it's. But I, I don't think it was the Log4j event that caused it. I think it was actually prior to that. It was a bigger event that kind of brought it to light and brought it to everybody's attention. So that, that was kind of the impact from my perspective. That's obviously locally within in the HSE. Luckily, at that point, I had escaped cyber recovery activities. So the Log4j <laughs> thing was no longer my problem, <laughs> right? <laughs> Other than, do you know anything about it? I know how to spell it. <laughs> so, um, Tony? Yeah, I think you covered the key area there, which is the context in which that news landed here, which was post the on-premises proprietary software derived cyber attack that crippled the service. You know, this was relatively, relatively small news, so there wasn't that much of a storm about it. I would add, though, that, you know, perfection is the enemy of the good. So I don't worry about open source software being perfect. I mean, my background is in emergency medicine and critical care. So, you know, you have to be honest with people that life is full of risks and, you know, you, you will not get perfect uh, software. You won't get perfect care. You won't get perfect government services. Let's just be honest about that. There will be a risk with open source software, but there's a risk with proprietary software. And we just need to be honest and say at least when it was open in the news, everybody knew about it. Um, and we were all able to get on with patching our stuff ASAP. And we, that's what we did. Um, do we know how much risk there is right now today with other stuff that's out there where those kind of vulnerabilities have not been publicly declared? You know the answer to that. <laughs> and at least we know that if there is an issue that we can all be working on it together. So um, I, I think we're, uh, we're running to the end of our discussion here today. I just want to say it's great to hear that, that there is momentum behind uh, the open source journey for the Irish government. Um, that's, that's good news for everyone in the open source ecosystem in Ireland um, and also for everyone else because we're here ready to collaborate. And I think that that's, that's a really great um, kind of place to go forward with and hopefully we'll get some more opportunities to do that based on these wonderful gatherings here in Dublin. So um, I wanted to say a huge thank you to our panellists today. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Gar. Thank you, Tony. Um, and a huge thank you for everyone in the audience and everyone on online and uh, hopefully uh, thank you and welcome again to Dublin I hope you're all having a great time and uh, hopefully we'll see you all again soon thanks very much